Well, thank you very much. So it's actually a, quite a big honor to be presenting with Doug alongside Doug. And I'll also be talking about the Mexico-US case. So the talk will touch upon theory and methods, but in relation to this case. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book project. And I have to say, this wouldn't be possible without Doug. Not only did he lay the theory, as Hein mentioned, he collected the data that I've used, but also, as a person, he's been incredibly helpful and supportive during my field work, so I want to thank him here. So I'm not going to talk about the qualitative component of the project. I just have one quote that I want to show you that I'm sorry, I, I know you're sick of this, but So in Mexico, we talk to migrants um, and non-migrants as well. And this is what one migrant told us when we asked them, why do people migrate? So he said, every person is a different world. They think differently. So it's a very simple point, but it's also profound. And it's something that we forget when we study migration. And it gets completely lost on the debates on migration as well. Migrants are a diverse population. They certainly are in the United States, but we saw in the talks in many of the cases that you are studying also. So if we look at the Mexicans in the United States, there are 12 million of them now, and about half of them are undocumented. So the big questions in the field are who are these migrants and what brings them to the United States? Now the point is there's really no single answer to these questions. So if you think about Mexico and the United States, they're both dynamic societies and they're changing profoundly over time. And so is the migrant flow between them. So if we look at a few figures, uh, there's a lot of changes that are going on. So if you look at in the 1970s, about 75% of the people who were crossing the border were men. In the 1990s, the share of men dropped to about 65%. So it looked like the, the migrant flow would reach gender parity at some point, but then the trend reversed. And in 2000s, again, uh, three-fourths of the migrants crossing were men. Now, the geographic origins in Mexico of migration also changed over time. So two-thirds of all migrants in the 1970s were coming from just five states in central western Mexico. So these were the traditional historical migrant sending areas. And then in the 1990s, the share of migrants coming from these regions dropped to a half, and in 2000s to a quarter. So we see a diversifying of uh, immigrant origins. And they also diversify the destinations, as Doug referred to it. So the once popular destinations were California, Texas, Illinois. And these places began to give way to new destinations like I don't know, Arizona or North Carolina um, in the United States. So what are the origins of these shifts? Or more generally, we can ask, what determines who migrates from Mexico to the United States. Now, a lot has been written on this topic and in multiple disciplines. And I'm actually you know, grateful to Doug's book for laying out the theories, but I'm also looking forward to Heinz's book, which will discuss these theories as well. But if you sort through these different you know, uh, lines of work in different disciplines, there's actually a few key ideas that uh, guide the discipline. So basically, most social scientists explain who migrates in one of three ways. They either refer to individual desires to maximize income, or they refer to family strategies to diversify risks to income, or they talk about social ties that develop between migrants in destination and others in origin. Now, these theories all have different micro-level motivations, and some of them have different units of analysis. But they also refer to different macro-level factors that are necessary for migration flows. So in the first neoclassical view, it's about wage differences and employment differences between regions. That's what's producing migration flows. In the new economics, the second theory, it's more about what's going on in the sending economy. It's about the uncertainty there. It's about the lack of markets or the failure of formal markets. Now in the final cumulative causation idea, it's all about past migration. So once migration flows start, they may even be decoupled from the macro level economic trends. Now, there are also other theories, and we saw them uh, in various talks. So the segmented labor market idea, it's all about this persistent demand in advanced economies like the US. Certain jobs are inhabited by immigrants, and then they become stigmatized, and then natives no longer want to work in them. So you have this persistent demand in place. Although Hannah's study in Zambia showed that the opposite could also be the case. Immigrants can be selected to the top tiers. Now, the other idea we heard about, I think it was Lucia's talk 
is the world systems idea, where it's about capitalist exp expansion. When you have these economic ties between different regions, you have uh, integration and you have flow of workers as well. Now, these are mostly macro-level theories. If you think about the micro-level implications or mid-level mechanisms of which groups in a population these would affect, there's really no guidance here. So when it comes to who migrates and why, again, we have three key ideas, the neoclassical, neoeconomics, and cumulative causation model. So a lot of the literature is about which of these ideas works um, in a given context. So that's not actually what I'm doing here. I'm not trying to see which of these ideas explains the Mexico-US case. Instead, I'm taking all of these ideas as equally plausible, and I'm trying to understand when and for whom each idea must, might be most relevant. So basically, the argument is very simple. Migrants might have different reasons for coming to the United States. So this is the guiding framework here. So it, it is a simple point, but it actually raises, I think, a general question about how we do social science. So why don't we have more people asking about this? And why don't we study as social scientists more the population heterogeneity? And um, so I'll step back a little bit here. I'll come back to my Mexican migrants in a bit. But in the social sciences, we're typically looking for general trends or general patterns. And the way we do that is we take an average case, like the white square here, and we study the path that led that case to an outcome. Why? But if we look at our sample, we can find actually other cases, like the circle or the triangle, that reach the same outcome, which would be migration in this case, but through different pathways. These cases might be very small in number, but it might be still critical for us to understand the process that led, leads to um, an outcome. Now, how do we study the different paths that can lead individuals to migrate? Well, we've seen some examples of this. We try to split our sample by time. Sometimes we study men and women differently. We saw in Giovanni's talk, in Yassir's talk, that education really matters. So we study college educated and non-college educated separately. But most of the time, we have one characteristic along which we divide our sample. We can't really consider multiple categories. If we do, our sample size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and we can't say much about um, each cell in our data. And actually, my, one of my colleagues at Harvard would say, it also has to do with the philosophy of social science. As social scientists, we somehow try to be like physicists. We try to come up with universal explanations that work in most cases. And he would also argue that this is actually a very wrong model for social science, where diversity is really essential uh, to understanding most processes. So basically, if we look at the work on migration, most of our work focuses on the average migrant. So we use methods like regression. Most of the studies that we've seen in the past two days were about, you know, we're using these methods. And it's a very powerful method, but it also limits the questions that we can ask. So we basically collect data in a way that we can run regressions. We pose our questions in a way that they can be answered by regression. For example, we typically compare migrants and non-migrants. And the question is, what determines who migrates? What are the differences between an average migrant and an average non-migrant? And then we don't consider so much the variety within each population. We don't have good tools for that. And then uh, we mold theories to fit the method. So we take each theory and we re reduce it to a number of independent variables. And then we include multiple <coughs> theories. And then we test which one of them has most explanatory power. So this, in a way, <coughs> fits theories as universal explanations. So the, each theory has to basically apply to everyone in our sample and kind of constantly over time. So we can't really uh, see these theories as complementary accounts that may work for different groups of individuals. So what I would argue is that migration theories, in fact, are conditional statements that they apply to in a specific context, very specific context, and a specific subset of the population. So how do we discover these different groups for which different theories may be at work? So this is the question. How do we discover the different paths that bring Mexicans to the United States? So this is the question. Now I'm going back to my empirical um, case. And I have a you know, I think a novel strategy here. So what I do first is I fix the outcome and I only study the migrants. So I'm selecting on the dependent variable and I search for different groups among migrants. And here I'm defining groups not on single attributes like education or gender, but configurations of multiple attributes. 
And the assumption that I'm making here is individuals who have similar configurations of attributes will face similar opportunity structures, to borrow from Heinz um, terminology. So if I am a poor, uneducated farmer in a rural area of Mexico, the conditions I'm facing will be similar to others who are like me. But those conditions could be very different from someone in the city who's more educated, who holds um, a, a white-collar job. So that's the idea behind it. And then, once I've discovered my different migrant groups, I study the conditions that set apart each group from the other migrant groups, as well as from the non-migrants. Now, here the selection issue comes in. Are these different groups being selected differently from the population, and are they responding to different macro-level conditions? In other words, I'm using these external shocks or external conditions to see if the groups I'm observing are real, and if they're <coughs> responding to specific um, conditions that are present at the time. So basically, I'm asking three related questions. Who migrates, when, and why? So the data is the Mexican Migration Project. Um, I don't think there were any studies using that, which shows, speaks to the diversity of this conference. But it's very popular in the US. Bulk of the research uh, on migration actually uses this data set that was collected by Doug and his uh, collaborators. So basically, the way the survey works is, is um, the researchers went to different Mexican communities and they randomly selected 200 households in these communities and interviewed, collected information on each member. And they used proxies for absent migrants. And they collected information on migration histories, on individual, on household and community characteristics. So the data now cover 143 communities and cover 24 states in Mexico. And so I used the retrospective information that they collected to reconstruct the characteristics of individuals on their first trip to the United States. So I'm measuring these characteristics on the first trip because I want to avoid the endogeneity issue. So migration is a very uh, important decision and a lot of things change about you once you migrate, your wealth, your household structure. So I want to catch people before migration changes them. So in the end, my sample contains about 20,000 migrants and they're all on their first trip to the United States which happened sometime between 1965 and 2000. So the method I'm using is cluster analysis. Some of you might be familiar with it, but so this is a group, this is a method that discovers groups with similar attributes in the data. So basically, <coughs> the method dis, uh, defines categories based on the attributes that you input and then places individuals in those categories. And it's very popular in the hard sciences, in computer science, neuroscience, but not so popular in the social sciences um, as well. So I'll go very briefly on how it works. I can come back to this in the Q&A. So first of all, like in regression, you choose the variables along which you want to classify your individual. It's like a variable selection thing. So you, here I selected individual demographic attributes, household wealth, community characteristics, but nothing at the macro level, not the economic trends, because I want to use them for external validation. And you choose an algorithm. This is not such a consequential decision. A lot of algorithms lead to similar results. And the K-means algorithm is a generic algorithm that doesn't make any assumptions about the data structure. And then this is perhaps the most consequential um, step. You choose a similarity measure. So I need, I know the characteristics of everyone in my sample. I need a way of assessing how similar people are to one another in the attribute space. And again, I went with a very simple measure, the city block distance. You basically difference everyone on each attribute, take the absolute values, and then sum it up. So if we're identical on all attributes, our distance would be zero. And then if we're different on all attributes, it would be the maximum distance. Now, the final step is you need to somehow tell the algorithm how many groups you expect in your data. Now, of course, you don't know how many groups you expect in your data, but you can try a bunch of different group numbers, ranging from, say, 2 to 12 or you know, 15, and then use some sort of model selection criteria to determine which one best fits your data. So I did that with diff six different validation measures, and the solution is there are four groups in my data. So who migrates? This is the answer to the first question. What do the four groups look like? So I'll show it with a picture. So this is a heat map. Um, so it looks complicated, but it's actually quite simple. So basically, imagine each individual in the data is represented by a column <coughs> of rectangles. And each rectangle is an attribute. So if you have that attribute, you have a great um, 
uh, color. If you don't have it, you have a white one. So uh, basically here, we're stacking all of the individuals side by side, and we keep the individuals in the same cluster together. And so we can see the entire data matrix here. So all the attributes I'm measuring are binary, whether you have land or not, whether you have business or not, high education or not. So um, basically, by just looking at this, you can see the gray area actually shifts across different groups. So we can see that the four groups have visibly distinct characteristics. So I'll walk you through that. If we look at the first group, so the attributes are the rows. And the attributes that distinguish this group from everyone else, also from the non-migrants, uh, are the following. So this group contains the highest share of men. Almost 90% of migrants in this group are men. And it also contains the highest share of migrants with very little education. So over 60% of migrants in this group have less than primary school education. They predominantly come from farming, farming communities, and almost all of them live in the central western Mexico. So this is the typical Mexican migrant we hear about, you know, uneducated, unskilled, uh, poor migrants from rural communities. Now the second group, so the distinguishing characteristics are green, it's quite different. So this is, almost everyone in this group is a teenager, between 15 and 19. And most of them are men, so they're the younger sons, typically, in their households. And interestingly, they come from relatively wealthy households. More than half live in a household that owns either a piece of land, or a property, or a business. So a very different profile from the first one. But they also come from rural communities. They also come from the Central West. Now the third group, if you can't tell by the pink color, contains mostly women. So about 70% of migrants in this group are women. And the group is also distinct in containing the highest share of people with family members or community members in Mexico and in the United States. So about 80% of the migrants here, the women here, have a husband or a father who is in the United States. And about 80% live in communities with high migration prevalence. So they also originate from the Central West. Now, the fourth group is a bit surprising. So it's much more educated. So about 75% of them have middle school or high school education. So this is higher than all the other migrant groups. It's also higher than non-migrants, significantly higher than non-migrants, controlling for temp temporal differences. The, this group also is different in the kind of community it comes from. The, almost all of them come from urban areas. And they don't originate from the Central West. Instead, they come from the border or Southeast or Central region. So we can actually see uh, the ge geographic location of these different groups. So the darker the color here, the more cluster one migrants the state has. So we see cluster one comes predominantly from the Central West. Same for cluster two, same for cluster three. And then the final group, suddenly everything changes. And we see the border region and the Central region gaining prominence. So we can ask, what explains the shift in this regional concentration of migrants? Or more generally, how can we understand the variation in migrant profile? So this brings us to, to my second question. When and under what circumstances does each group proliferate? Now, let's first look at the temporal signature of each group. So this figure here shows the number of cluster one migrants over time. And I corrected, I divided by the total number of residents uh, here, because the sample size is changing over time. So the denominator here is migrants plus non-migrants. So basically, this group was quite large in size. In fact, it was the largest migrant group in the 1970s. At that time, it accounted for 70% of all migrants uh, coming from Mexico to the US. But then the size of this group declined consistently over time, and it became a minority in the 2000s. Now, the second group has a different profile. So it existed in the 1970s, <coughs> mid-1970s. And then it rose to majority status. It became quite large. It contained one in two migrants <coughs> in the mid-1980s. And then it declined thereafter and became a minority in 2000. Now the third group, and if you remember, these are the women with ties. Again, we see a slow increase over time. But then something happens in the early 1990s, and this group suddenly enjoys a big jump and somewhat retains that uh, value. And the final group, these are the urban, educated men, mostly uh, in the border area. This group was very small in the 1970s and 1980s. And then it you know, enjoyed this big increase through the 1990s and 2000s. And actually, today, in 2010, it's the majority 
migrant group, about 70% of Mexican migrants who are coming for the first time to the United States belong to this group. So we basically see, I mean, two points are worth making here. Each group is present in each year, right? So there's no one migrant type, but to different degrees. So there's a very clear temporal signature to each group. The first group dominates the 1970s, the second group the 1980s, and then the third group rises in the 1990s, and the final group actually becomes a majority in late 1990s and 2000s. So basically, what's going on here? How do we explain these trends? And this brings me to the third question of why. Now, basically the question I'm asking here is, are different cr clusters responding to different macro level conditions? So beginning this, I said that we're looking for these different groups among migrants and we're assuming each one of them faces a different opportunity structure. So this is actually a way of testing them. If these groups are real, then I would expect them to respond to different conditions. Um, or at least respond, that, respond to the economic conditions at large, not necessarily different conditions. But So basically, here I'm going to show only the macro level results, but in the book there are many micro level analyses as well that looks at selection patterns at the individual level. But here, I'm basically running regressions. I'm taking the trends in each uh, migrant type and I'm relating them to different macro level factors. And the same results hold if you run the models at the individual level. This is just simpler to explain. So basically, the things that I um, include in the model are things that are suggested by different theories. So in the neo neoclassical theory, it's all about wage differences. So I have controls for wages in the US, all in real terms, wages in Mexico, unemployment rates in both countries. And also, the, something that Doug also mentioned as being critical, Border Patrol Enforcement Budget, because that determines the cost of trying to cross, especially without documents. Now, the new economics theory basically tells us about the importance of the origin economy, especially the uncertainty in the economy. And here, the inflation rate in Mexico basically tracks the crises, the economic crisis quite well, so does the change in the peso value, uh, the dollar value of the peso, which tracks the peso devaluations. Again, correlated with different economic crises. Now, in the cumulative position idea, it's about past migration patterns and visa availability for family reunification, again, would capture that and also capture the policy context in the US. Um, so the other things are to the change in employment in migrant heavy industries. Again, this is to track the demand for migrant labor in the US and also the Mexico-US trade, which is an important indicator for the world systems idea. So basically, I won't show you the full models, but just the main results. So the question we're asking is, are they responding to different conditions? Now, for cluster one, two factors stand out. The US low-skill wage, wages, the average wages for low-skill work, and the budget of the Border Patrol enforcement. So the first is positively related, the second is negatively related, as we would expect. And these two factors alone actually account for 90% of the variation in the size of this group. And in fact, the relationship are so distinct that you can see them in raw data. So I'm just going to show you the first one. So the red line here again is the number <coughs> of migrants in cluster one, adjusted for the sample size. And the blue line here is the real US wages for low skill work. So again, you see this you know, um, correspondence between the two lines. So when the US wages were high, around $20 per hour, this group was really high. And then as the US wages declined to about $16 per hour, so did the size of cluster one. And actually, you can trace the peaks in wages and the corresponding peaks in the size of this group almost in every year. So in 1972, in 1977, after a peak in the blue line, you see a peak in the red line. And in 1984, and then in 1986. So basically, if we're looking to theory and trying to see which theory is this most consistent with, we would say neoclassical theory is consistent with the behavior of this group. This group is responding to the change in cost and you know, payoffs of migration. Now, what happens to our second group? So for our second group, the wages don't matter at all. Unemployment rate <coughs> doesn't matter. But the most important factor for the trend is the Mexican inflation. And again, the border patrol budget is somewhat important. So, so the relationship is, again, we, is something that we can see in the raw data, not only in the models. So the blue line here is the rate of inflation, and the pattern is almost identical when you look at peso devaluation. So basically, in Mexico in the 1980s, there were 
and late 1970s, there were two peso devaluations. Um, and the economy was in turmoil, and it was actually considered a <coughs> lost decade for the Mexican economy at the time. So again, we see this group, the younger sons from relatively wealthy households, being you know, mobilized right around the time of this economic volatility uh, increases in Mexico. Again, if you look at the different peaks in 1976, there was a peso devaluation and the inflation rate basically sh uh, shut up. <coughs> and in two years, we see a peak in this group. And again, in 1982, another peso devaluation. In 1986, these are all the periods of crisis and in 1994. So these are somewhat you know, crisis migrants, if you will. Um, so some scholars actually res you know, talk about um, 1980s um, crisis migrants. So this group corresponds to that. And again, if we're looking to theory, it would be consistent with the new economics model. Now, what about the third one? So the third group is women uh, with family ties to uh, US migrants. And here, we see the US visas are the most important factor. And again, you see that the jump in the late 1980s and early 1990s corresponds exactly the, to post urca period. And we talked about this on our first day. So Urca was a legislation that was passed in the US in 1986. So it did two things. So on the one hand, it increased uh, border enforcement and employer sanctions. So it, it became illegal to hire undocumented migrants. But it also legalized more than 2 million Mexicans who were already in the United States. So these migrants could now petition to bring their wives and children to the United States. And actually, you can see this in the aftermath of this legislation, the number of uh, migrants in this group almost doubling and then declining slowly afterwards. So they were responding to this pol policy change. And again, this is more or less consistent with this cumulative causation idea. It's not just about economic trends, but once flows start, they gain their own momentum. They have their own dynamic. And here it's all about family reunification. Once you have the migrants <coughs> in place, they want to bring their families, especially since the border is also tightening at the same time. Now, the fourth group is, I think, a puzzle. So there's some evidence that the rise of this group is related to the rise in trade. But I think it's harder to make a case for this. Because in the first three groups, you can actually imagine the mechanisms at the individual level that would create those aggregate patterns. And I do a lot of that in the book. So for the first group, you have the poor, uneducated migrants. And this group actually enjoys the highest returns to international migration. So they enjoy the highest income increase. And then, if you think about the second model, the wealthier households sending their sons, again, the risk diversification at the micro level makes sense, that you would keep the household head at home to take care of the business at home, and you would send the younger son. So you can imagine these micro level mechanisms, and you can actually see it in qualitative data as well. In the third case, the family unification, again, having a husband or a father in the US could explain why individuals are being mobilized. But here, you think about something aggregate like trade, mobilizing these urban migrants. And it's, the links are not clear, and we need more information on that. So I haven't written that chapter yet. I'm working on it. But I have some ideas that come out of the uh, qualitative data. And I think the most intriguing one of the, is, is something that I talked to Ron about, um, this link between internal and international migration. So in Mexico, through the 1970s and 1980s, there was a rise in international migration, but also in internal migration to the cities. And the city is basically filled to capacity at some point, And they became kind of regions of poverty. So poverty moved from rural areas to urban areas. And that created pressures in the city for people to migrate. And of course, at that time, NAFTA came in. There was economic restructuring. And crime was rising. So all of these different things can explain the rise of this group. But I don't think there is a, actually a clear micro-level theory that would predict this migrant profile to be migrating under these conditions. But at the macro level, we can actually see it as sort of like a world systems uh, phenomenon. So basically, um, what does this exercise achieve? So I think first, for me, one of the important things was showing the diversity <coughs> among migrants. So we typically, in the US, read about, so Doug talked about all the derogatory terms that are, using for, that are used for migrants. But we hear about this unskilled you know, migrant, <coughs> the peasant migrant who comes to make a buck. But it's actually only one characterization among many possible. And these migrants, we have different groups that are responding to different conditions. So it seems that some people are chasing opportunities in the US, 
Some people are escaping the constraints and dire conditions in Mexico, and some people are just trying to keep their families together. So if we need to think about policy, immigration policy, it's not just a matter of economic policy, how many immigrants do we want, but we also need to think about our foreign relations, our development policy in our neighbors, and we also need to think about families, how we think about families. So it's a very complex process. And from a theoretical standpoint, we can see that different theories can speak to the behavior of different groups. So in this way, I mean, they're not universal statements, they're conditional statements that apply under specific circumstances and apply to specific groups of people. So they can be truly complementary and could be integrated. And I use a very descriptive method here, and I think these methods are helpful in helping us generate new hypotheses. Causal identification is important as well, but it's, I think, a later stage of migration. I think we need more methods to discover new things in our data, and we need more methodological variety in migration research, I think, and in social science in general. So the regression framework is helpful. As you can see, I'm using it here as well, but there's a lot more out there. And I think some of the best work is being done by qualitative scholars who show not just the aggregate patterns, but how they're produced by individuals' decisions and understandings. Also, something that we didn't see is agent-based models. How you know, simple rules, individuals following simple rules can produce this very complex aggregate system. So anyway, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.